Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Icebreakers 2020. Um, Icebreakers, for those of you that haven't been here before, is uh, short, quirky, five minute presentations of interest to people um, attending here. Um, it is um, this year going to be, I think, nine presentations, so I'm not going to stay very long up here. Um, the main thing is to keep it to the speakers, is to keep it within five minutes, to keep it interesting and to keep it short. To police that, we have Stuart. Stuart is a penguin. It's a puffin. Stuart is a penguin. Stuart loves icebreakers. Stuart hates people who talk for longer than five minutes. So, what we're going to do, we have an alarm that goes off after five minutes. Stuart is going to land on stage. Stuart might even attack the speaker <laughs> after five minutes. So, people of interest will be handed Stuart, and when the alarm goes off, they'll be expected to throw Stuart either at the speaker or on stage to let the speaker know that their time is up. We'll see how that goes. Just before we start, we lost a great friend uh, of the Autumn School this year and uh, Bob Burton, I was going to ask Bob Headland, uh, 22 out of 22, he hasn't missed a single um, Autumn School yet, uh, to say a couple of words on Bob before we start. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Bob H talking about Bob B, to be short, quirky and not have a penguin fly at me. Uh, he was a regular. Thai, as many of you know for many years, with Jackie, his wife. Originally a biologist from a family with much connection with biology. His time south with the British Antarctic Survey, on Sydney Island, Bird Island, and South Georgia in the early days when Bass took over. And of course, he was in and out of the Falkland Islands on the way. There were changes in South Georgia after the war, and a museum was established. Now the South Georgia Museum, originally South Georgia Whaling Museum, which of course involved much liaison with Norway. Thus, with the history, the background of what had happened on the island, Bob became more fascinated, more informed, dealing much more with historical geography. I suppose it comes with age as you get a little more ancient. Also, the South Georgia connection emphasised the Shackleton connection the resting place of Shackleton, and so much of the history of the island. Bob had involved himself in many polar circles, many organisations and so forth. He had the Polar Medal. He was one of the founders of the South Georgia Association, active and editor for the British Antarctic Survey Club, and, for South Georgia matters, a member of the Antarctic Place Names Committee. Magnificent source of information, much research, a lot of what I think we can rightly call detective work, solving mysteries, making observations, and various investigations of things that may or may not be quite as what they were said to be. <coughs> Communications, where well, we've all heard him lecturing and talking about things in a thigh, but extremely well, I think in my opinion, in the general opinion. Likewise, of all ships, with public lectures, he distributed the knowledge, not only in the South, but also much involved with Greenland and other parts of the Arctic. He was very helpful with information. If someone had questions and problems, he was a very useful source. He always liked to challenge in this sort of case, it resulted in the spreading of knowledge. And of course, an ironic humor, a certain comments from Bob, we cannot forget, and some fascinating observations. On his passing, his will bequeathed a very substantial polar library which is on its way to a fire. Jackie would normally have been here. Indeed, we had tickets on the airline we won't mention, and uh, I was due to meet her at San Stansted Station. But, as you might know, she's a nurse, she got the flu, she knows how to protect herself and others. So it is with her regrets that she's not present today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's Bob H on Bob B. <laughs> This year of um, Bob's passing, uh, we have 
Special Icebreakers um, Award designed by Sven. Do you want to come at Sven for a second? Show yourself. There's Sven. <laughs> Everybody knows Sven from the film that you're going to see tomorrow night. Um, this is it. Beautiful piece. Anybody recognize the shape? Yeah? South Georgia. So the place that he was most associated with. So, uh, Joe, Joe is going to um, adjudicate the winner at the end. Um, not just me, not just me. Like <laughs> <laughs> there, there are four on the panel. Four on the panel. Okay. Apologies, Joe. Four on the panel. Uh, first speaker up is uh, Seamus, who we all know. And um, I don't know if put your hands up at once, but I know lots of people who'd love to laugh at still tired. <laughs> uh, so we might give it anybody, anybody want to do it? Yeah, here we go. Seamus? <laughs> Slide and there's come. This is the Lusitania transatlantic liner off the head can sail on the 7th of May 1915, uh, 11 miles off the head. And there's a conversation going on in the first class veranda cafe between a young man called Harold Bo Bolton and another older man. And the conversation goes like this I'm worried about the U boats, I'm worried about torpedoes. The older man says, Not to worry, loads of lookouts, bright day, nothing's going to happen. Two simultaneous crashes two minutes later. The ship was sinking. Who is the older man on the ship? Giving the wrong words of reassurance. John Foster, Joseph Foster Stackhouse. From, from Cumbria, born a year before Shackleton. And the reason I mention here is that he's probably the polar explorer you have never heard about. What was his background in polar exploration? He led the Jan Mayan expedition of 1911. Jan Mayan is an island between Spitsbergen and Iceland, a rocky, forlorn kind of place. And this little image here to my left is of a little book published by a guy called Baron von Klinkenstrop, a Swedish scientist who went on the trip and wrote a very amusing little booklet about this, this trip. He's pictured here with his son Harold, who also travelled the expedition. It was composed of British, German and Swedish, and one Irishman called Swan from Dublin. And the title of the book is called With the Britons and Teutons to San Jan Mayen. It was a disaster. They had 25 tons of coal, they needed 50 tons of coal. They had no warm weather equipment, they had no warm weather clothing. When they got to Yan Mai, they couldn't land. They also discovered, if you look at this picture to the far, my far left, the group of men standing around the binnacle there, and the man in the middle with the hat, that's Stackhouse. They forgot to bring a chronometer. For those who are not familiar with navigation, the chronometer is what determines your longitude. It tells you where you are and where you can go. So after about two days tooting around Yan Mai, they returned back to Iceland. Of course, Mr. Swan, the Irishman, said, we need some record of our landing on Yan Mai. Let's just make it up. <laughs> so they found the rocky shore of Iceland, but discovered there was little bits of evidence of human habitation. Old sardine tins, old cans. They cleaned it up. Mr. Swan rolled his camera, rolled his camera, and they planted the Union Jack on the coast of Iceland. No, no, the coast of Yan Mai. So that should be the end of Joseph, John, Joseph Officer Tackhouse's polar career. That's not the case at all. Here he is, two, three years later. He became involved with Scott's Terranova expedition in a fundraising capacity in the north of England. He was designated an honorary secretary and raised funds and sponsored the purchase of two ponies for the South Polar Expedition. At the same time, after Scott passed away, he decided he would mount his own expedition to the South Pole. And like all good at world explorers, he produced a prospectus of what he was going to do and who he's going to bring with him as well. This time round, he mentioned Tom Crean was going to come with him. We all know who Tom Crean is. Arthur Harbour. Arthur Harbour was the second officer on Shackleton's Nimrod expedition as well. He was going to explore King Edward VII land because Scott wanted him to. Funnily enough, Scott's wife didn't think that was the case because she wrote to the Times in 1913 disputing this very fact, as well as members of the Terranov expedition as well. But unfortunately for Stackhouse, of course, 1914, the war came in August of that year. The expedition was not going to happen and he couldn't raise the funds. So he changed tack. He decided he was going to have the International Oceanographic Expedition instead, which was going to take seven years and travel a quarter of a million miles across the globe. Now, as you know, this is now that the publication called Discovery to my far left shows the discovery. He put a thousand pound deposit on the Discovery ship from Hudson Bay Company, but couldn't raise the rest of the money. But unfortunately, then four or five months later, he's on the on board the deck of the Lusitania. What happens to poor Joseph Foster Stackhouse? He's actually extraordinarily brave. There is a description by Lieutenant Lasker of his last moments. He has a life jacket, he finds a young child, 
He gives her his life jacket. He's offered his place in the lifeboat. He says, no, give it to somebody else. And he's last spotted on the ship, going down the ship. Amazingly enough, his body is actually recovered a few days later. And he's buried, actually, in the graveyard in Cove in County Cork. And the little quote there at the top of the screen, let mercy be our boast and shame, only, our, shame our only fear, was in a crumpled note in his pocket, found in his body. And he has the unique distinction of being the only leader of an heroic age expedition buried in Ireland. Thank you.